everyone. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Comic Book Confidential Podcast. My name is Jay Castro, and with me I have my old pal Corbin and my old pal Matt. And this episode, we're going to talk comics. This episode, it's going to be like all the other episodes. We're going to talk comics. We're going to talk comics and more comics. And um, yeah, yeah, because we we are lovers of comic books. We're fanatics of that particular um, uh, storytelling method. Um, it's our lives. We love it. We love talking about it. And so hopefully you will like listening to it. Um, we're going to start out with a little bit of news here. Um, Hollywood Reporter, and, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, they did a piece on Michael Keaton uh, saying that uh, there, Michael Keaton said there's a strong possibility that Marvel and DC universes wouldn't exist without Tim Burton. Granted, you know, Michael Keaton, star of 1989's Tim Burton Batman. What do you guys think about that? You guys think uh, Tim Burton's the linchpin of uh, the modern day <laughs> comic book movie? I mean, <clears throat> I feel like he may have been the initial match that set off the proverbial fire, right? But also, I almost feel like that's disrespectful to. The 1978 mm-hmm. Superman, right? Like, believing a man could fly. Mind you, yes. Like, it did kind of lose steam as it kept going, you know? By the time it ended in 87, it was definitely, you know, a faint shadow of what it was at the beginning. But it still kept its ethos. It still kept the character coming to life from the comics to the big screen in a way that actually reflected, okay, a comic book character, right? I think Batman 89, what Tim Burton did was really bring that gothic, moody feel of the comics you know, over the last, let's be real, the Batman comics were just getting dark in, you know, the 70s, you know, with Neil Adams and such into, you know, culminating 86 with Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. But he took that and brought it in. That really kind of kicked it up a whole nother notch. But I do think that it already started with the Superman movies beforehand. Um, with that being said, he does deserve a lot of credit. You know, 89 Batman was huge. Uh, Batman Returns in 92 was also a big deal. And it kicked off the other ones, you know? So I definitely think he deserves a lot of credit, but maybe not as much as is given to him in this piece. Well, I think mm. you got to go back as far as, I mean, you mentioned the the Christopher Reeve stuff. I think you got to go further back to the George Reeve stuff of the, the 50s and then, yeah. you know, the Batman 66 and just that far back. Now, I, I do, I think he's definitely worthy of being credited as the the guy who showed really that superheroes can bring in box office numbers that superheroes can exist on a big screen mm-hmm. as far as saying that it's they're responsible for like your current mcu i i don't think that's the case because if you don't if you don't have movies like the original sam raimi spider-man trilogy or you know even the for spider for or the original x-men stuff or the even go further back to as Nolan's Batman. Mm-hmm. Do we have an MCU today? If that stuff doesn't become gangbusters, do we have an MCU today? And I, I don't think that stuff's directly impacted by what Tim Burton did with with that with that first Batman film. That first mm-hmm. Batman film is always going to be iconic and legendary, but to say it, you know, it's responsible for the the launching of today's superhero culture and as far as cinema goes that's that's a big boy statement in my opinion (laughs) yeah so uh michael keaton goes on he, he says tim burton deserves enormous credit he changed everything keaton said of burton's decision to cast him as a superhero despite the uproar he says i can't necessarily say this but there's a strong possibility there is no marvel universe there's no dc universe without tim burton See, I think that's a big statement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a but I mean, born of immense uh, gratitude to Burton. Yeah, definitely. He's got a huge, 
I think an enormous, you know, chunk has to of gratitude has to go to him. But to say that without him, you wouldn't have today's TCU or our Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's a big statement because you've got other films that launched that, you know, that launched that like Sam Ray, like I said, Sam Ray, Spider-Man one, two, and I guess three, if you want to throw it in there, if you want a little emo Toby in your life, um, the original uh, X-Men first three X-Men films, Batman yeah. begins kind of, you know, the Superman. I mean, after the Brandon Routh stuff, Superman was all, but look, all but dead. And then you got the Zack Snyder kind of rebooted him with man of steel and, which reignited that, you know, movie popularity for that character. So I, I just think there's a lot of variables that go into play when you're saying, you know, this person or that person is responsible for the DC or MCU. And without them, it wouldn't exist. I mean, definitely give Burton his flowers for what he did as far as like showing that superheroes are and those movies are profitable on the big screen. And that people will consume that content outside of the average comic book reader. Mm-hmm. Um, because you got to remember, even then, like comic book readers like us, we were looked down on at that point in time. We were the nerds. <laughs> we were the outcasts. We weren't, it wasn't popular to watch, like comics like it is today. So and it wasn't popular to really be into those movies like it is today. So, you know, it's, I think it's a different landscape, but I think you give them as props. But I, I, like I said, I think it's a big boy statement and very bold to say that without, Tim Burton, we wouldn't have the MCU or DCU as we know it. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you guys this, and I hope this isn't, you know, a, a tangent or something, but is it popular to read comics? I know it's popular to, uh, uh, you know, watch comic book movies or animated shows, but to actually like, like pick up weekly comics I don't know. <laughs> I still think that's nerd. I still think that's frowned upon. Uh, oh, go ahead, Corbin. Oh, well, I appreciate it, man. Sorry. No, I was, I'm probably going to say much of what you think. I don't think it's looked down upon. I just think it's rare. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, to find people who are always consistently picking up the daily comics, right? And mind you, I mean, where am I right now? The comic scene's a little different. Like, you definitely have some, some peak fandoms, just very specific places that are not where I'm at. But, like when you run into another weekly reader, it's like we, you know, weekly warrior. It's like, oh wow, okay, cool. You know, it's not so much as looked down upon, just as not the thing to do. And a lot of that goes to other reasons. You know, the, the the comic stories and the quality of said stories, how expensive comics have gotten. There's a whole lot of factors mm-hmm. to why you know you don't have a lot of people reading them regularly, consistently like that. But I don't think like if I was walking around with comics, I mean, I do at my job. Like, I don't think people are gonna make fun of it. You know what I mean? Like that's at least my advantage point on it. At least not to your face. There you go. <laughs> well, and people have seen the monetary value that these comics are are require you know demanding now. Like you, you see a, a Superman and Action Comics one selling for you know a couple million dollars. Uh, ASM mm-hmm. or not ASM, but Amazing Fantasy fifteen selling for you know a couple hundred thousand up to a million, or Batman, or, you know, or Detective Comics selling for millions of dollars. They, you starting to see the the price tag these books com- command. And it kind of maybe adjusts your view on things nowadays to where I think there are, st- there's still a lot of, of weekly readers. Like I go in the comic book shop every Wednesday and you see people packed in there and with the power of the internet, like that's opened up space for people who normally maybe don't have a local shop to read their, this, everything that's coming out every Wednesday. And it, it still surprises me today when someone that, you know, you look at and, and I will say, I'll say judge, but not necessarily judge, but, you're like, oh, I would have never took you for somebody who reads comics. And they're like, oh, yeah, I, I love what's going on in Batman. Or I love what's going on in Spider-Man or what's going on in, you know, Transformers or G.I. Joe or whatever your your flavor of the week is. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 like like Corbin said, I, I think it's accepted now. Like I never hear anybody that's like, oh, I I read comics and they're like, oh, nerd or, you know, they're, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I. I collect comics and I go, oh, that's cool. Like, what do you collect? Or mm-hmm. I do a comic book podcast. Oh, that's cool. Like, what do you guys talk about? Or, you know, tell me a little bit about it. Or there, there's a general interest. And I think that's what the MCU and DCU have done is they've kind of opened that door to the general interest to where like you see people the minute they announce, Oh, so-and-so is going to be in this. 
you go to eBay and look for that first appearance and that book is just boom and it's selling like crazy. So yeah. it, it's a lot of money driven. I think the the popularity of the movies, the money behind it and people saying, seeing that there's monetary value in, in funny pages where they're not just reading them and rolling them up and sticking them in walls and, you know, like they used to do back in the early days and mm-hmm. and things there's there's mo- actual monetary value in these things now it it's kind of made it acceptable and more mainstream and cool cool maybe stretching it but no uh, <laughs> but, but it's still one of those things that um if you find someone that is a weekly reader dude you're suddenly friends you know like like my daughter's volleyball coach my little eighth grade daughter's volleyball coach um my wife kind of let it slip that i read comics and turns out he's a wednesday warrior too and all of a sudden dude we're like oh we gotta go do this we gotta yeah yeah you know it's like the the instant bond's still there Mm -hmm. you know and that's still that's kind of cool you know i I like that that it's still at that level you know because you know everybody loves the mcu everybody loves d you know batman everybody you know, you somebody said, "Oh yeah, I like Batman. And I like Batman too." Yeah, who doesn't? You know, yeah. I like it that there's still that connection that you can make with with a weekly reader. But anyway, I mean, I don't know about you, but the minute I told my wife, "Hey, I read comics," she was like, "Oh my god, marry me now!" So yeah, <laughs> I wish I was so lucky, but no, I'm yeah, no, I'm either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least they understand. I'll yeah, give, yeah. I'll give up. <laughs> Yeah, it's tolerated. <laughs> Matt, Matt was like, love at first panel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now that's a name for a show right there. Um, there you go. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, Collider names 10 MCU movies that are almost perfect. Okay. So I'm going to read a little bit. He says, uh, this guy named Eddie Pachelle. Anyway, Mm -hmm. he says, while some may say that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is in a rough place at the moment, it's had a plethora of astounding films over the years. Um, So uh, he says, there's arguably no such thing as a flawless film, but there are some films that come as close as one can get to perfect. And here's a list of 10 of those MCU movies that are almost perfect. Number 10, bottom of the barrel, Marvel's The Avengers, 2012 The Avengers, Joss Whedon. My opinion, it should should be maybe a little bit higher. I don't know about y'all. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, Number nine is Ant-Man first ant-man oh okay Keep, go on okay yeah, not sure that should i don't know i don't <laughs> okay number mm-hmm. eight no no this shouldn't even be on here in my opinion shang chi and the legend of the ten rings okay okay i need to get all the others to get a good yeah. feel for it okay. Mm-hmm. okay okay number seven deadpool <laughs> deadpool and wolverine Okay. I don't think that should be on this list at all. <laughs> it's a listen. It's a fun movie, and I think people have nostalgia, nostalgia glasses for it because it's cameo after cameo and cameo. The cameos are what make that movie. If you really get past that and break it down to core story, the movie's got more holes in it than Swiss cheese. Yeah, it, it, it's not very. It's not a great story driven movie, but just the no. fact that it's Deadpool and the cameos and you're seeing these two characters together for the first time, you you kind of, like, excuse all of that. So to say it's almost perfect is a bold statement. Yeah, I know. Because it's, it's definitely not almost perfect. Yeah. Character-driven, for sure. Yes. Um, number six, Thor Ragnarok. Interesting. <laughs> number five, Infinity War. Okay. Number four, Black Panther. Number three, uh, First Iron Man. Number two, Guardians of the Galaxy. And the number one, almost perfect MCU movie, 
Captain America, the Winter Soldier. I'm okay with number one. Are you? I'm okay with number one. I think it's the perfect mix of like an espionage, like actual thriller. It has obviously superhero element to it. It has good characterization. Like I, I think it's pretty good. I have Black Panther a little bit higher. Guardians of the Galaxy drop a little bit lower. Um, yeah. What do you think about that, Matt? Uh, I mean, what's the the basis for almost perfect? Because you talk to a lot of people, and they, a lot of critics and I think fans alike would say that when it comes to the perfect MCU movie, it would be Captain America when a soldier. Like that's like the pinnacle. That's like on everybody, mostly everybody's Mount Rushmore of MCU movies. Um, mm-hmm. I I think Guardians. I think Guardians. Uh. I don't know if I would consider Guardians almost perfect. I think Guardians is kind of in that that space where it gets this, it gets a little bit of play and a little bit of wiggle room and love because people didn't know what to expect from Guardians. Outside the avid comic book reader, people didn't know what who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. Yeah. So they kind of get that like pass because it was that you know taking that relatively unknown team, put them on a big screen, and it worked. Uh, it, those characters are vastly different from what they were in the comic books. Oh yeah, for the most part, and so I guess I could see that um, being almost perfect. But I, I, like I said, I think it gets such a high ranking because it's kind of like that under the radar darling that nobody had expectations for it and knocked it to the park. Because when you compare Guardians one and two together, two two drops off quite a bit. Um, yeah. what a, I think I, I can't believe Infinity War. Or was Infinity War on there? Um, yeah, yes. it was. Yes. It's, it's five. Yeah. See, I think five, that yeah. should be number two because Infinity War is that movie that gave us something that we've never seen before. How often do you see the villain win? How often do you see that the villain does, does exactly what he sets off to do, takes his armor off, sets it on, you know, on his little scarecrow and sits down to watch the sun, the sunset over what he just accomplished. That that yeah. right there gives you so much. You you see these relatively godly characters mm-hmm. broken. You see Thor broken. You know, and the bad guy won. You you see these characters wiped out, erased, and the bad guy wins. And we had to sit with that for a year. <laughs> you know, so that yeah. to me is like almost perfect. No, I agree. I think I think that's a really good point. Like the theater, I mean, we all remember where we were as that was ending and the shock and even the hoopla that was around it. Like you had movie theaters with the sign saying, like, please don't say anything as you leave the theaters. Like, mm-hmm. don't spoil it for like it was that crazy. You know, the stun I, I I mean, I feel like I feel like all of us here are comic vets, comic book movie vets. Like we know the rhythm of a comic book. We know the rhythm of a comic book movie and when it ends. And we all were like, wait, what the fudge? Like we didn't like no idea. Like I know I left yeah. in the stunned silence. And like Matt said, we had to sit on that a whole year. We were pissed. We were excited. Like that <laughs> was perfect. You know, that's basically the, the, the movie equivalent of a weekly, right? Like you finish right. the score, you have a cliffhanger, whatever the case may be. And you're like, oh my God, what's next? We don't know until this certain period of time. So come to think of it, no, I agree with Matt. I might put that, like I said, number one, number two, or number one, and they probably have Winter Soldier right behind it because Winter Soldier, a fine film, it holds up well, same as Affinity. But again, like you said, as a fan, the uh, the, the the feeling you had leaving was was like no other movie. Just think of the emotion it, it pulled out of you when you, you know, the Mr. Stark, I don't feel very good. And you just oh see, my gosh. you know, Peter Parker disintegrate in, in Iron Man's arms. And it was like that question of, well, where was this person? Where was that person? What what happened? You know, mm-hmm. it, it caused it spawned you to question everything you've seen in the you know, up to that point through the MCU. So I think that should be a little bit higher. I mean, if I think the first Iron Man is per is just about as perfect as you can get. Like sure. I don't yeah. see a lot of people have complaints about the first Iron Man movie. Um Thor Ragnarok is an interesting one because I guess it kind of looks like what Thor do you like? Do you like that more comic book stoic, you know, Thor that you got in Thor one? Or do you like a little bit more of the quirky Thor that you get in Ragnarok? And I think Ragnarok gets it because they they took a character that a lot of people, I think, after the first Thor movie 
could really care less about could take or leave. And they kind of brought a little bit more comedic value to him to make him a more played on an important character in, in Ragnarok. Ragnarok kind of flipped because I mean, you had Thor one and then dark world and the dark world just does not get play at all. And then Ragnarok kind of flipped it on his head and, and Tiko Waititi restored faith in our faith in Thor and our curiosity and interest in that character. So, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if I would say it's, it's darn near perfect. Cause there's a lot of things I think could have been done better and played better. Um, but I mean, I, I can see where they're, they're going for that. The idea is there. I'm with you. Like Matt, I think the idea is there just like it was a Guardians of the galaxy, but for reasons that he mentioned, I also agree. Like I wouldn't personally have it there but i get it what says you about you jay um uh, i am a more of a fan of of uh the more traditional thor so i i like kenneth branagh's first thor movie a lot and if i'm going by like like what the way i always see things is is if i like them and as how much do i replay them you know how much when I'm sitting there folding laundry or, or, you know, whatever, which ones do I tend to gravitate more over and over? And, um, winter soldier is definitely one of them. First iron man's definitely one of them. Um, guardians of the galaxy for sure. Um, we already talked. Yeah. First iron man already talked about that black Panther for sure. Um, infinity war. I enjoyed it, but I don't rewatch it very often. Um, I don't know why. I just don't. Um, and like I said, Thor Ragnarok, I don't. I don't ever watch that. I watch it a few times. Um, Deadpool and Wolverine, I don't see myself coming back to it because, like Matt said, it's the cameos, it's the surprises, it's the, you know, and once you kind of blew through it, you know. I've I've seen it a couple twice already in theaters and it's fine, but I I don't see myself coming back to it very much. Um, oh, I do. I I mean I've watched it four or five times. I'm not gonna lie. Like I love the movie, but when you break it down structurally and you take away all the Wolverine cameos and you take away the the out that opening sequence and you take away kind of all the you know the cameos, it's like the story itself is very middle of the road. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what kind of has to hold up for rewatchability. I think, um, sure. because all those other stuff is it's gimmicky, you know? Oh, I mean, I think black Panther should be higher up too, because yeah, I mean, black Panther right. has always been a known character, but what, what the MCU did and Chadwick Boseman, and they took that character to a iconic status made a mainstream yes that general mainstream iconic status cultural icon that you know is so heartfelt and even even chadwick boseman you know still is referenced to as the the king of wakanda and Mm -hmm. your black panther and so it's like that movie for sure is is darn near perfect like there's some some plot lines and, and, and they the mcu did something in that in that movie that they've only really ever done with Infinity War and Endgame is they made you care about the villain. They made you sympathize with the villain. Like you could sympathize with Eric Killmonger and why he's doing what he's doing and in his, you know, path that he's on and what he's trying to achieve that you, you can sympathize with that. So I think there's, I, I don't, there's some things I would probably change about Black Panther, but if you held my feet to the fire and say, what would they be? I don't know if I could tell you. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, the villain. Like Killmonger, but it felt very much like Iron Man, Iron Monger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I felt like the plotting of that. I mean, we're not going to. I'm sorry. I, you you left it open in a good way. And here I go diving into No, this. you're fine. Joe, you're you're good. Good. <laughs> I would say the one thing I liked was like the duality of the nuance, nuance that they built between um, Black Panther or T'Challa and Killmonger, the different outlooks they both have and the shared experience that they both experience, but on opposite sides of the coin. Mm-hmm. I felt that could have been. Fle- it was fleshed out really well, and then ultimately, okay, the superheroes like, like the superpower they got to fight, and then you lose one. You know what I mean? Like 
I really thought there was more to explore. They kind of did that in a dream sequence with Killmonger and Black Panther 2, but there was mm. so much else going on with that movie due to the emotional component outside of it that it didn't really feel like we were really paying attention, you know? Um, so that's one thing for sure I, I would have appreciated a little bit more. Um, and there's a few other things. Like you said, in terms of pacing, plotting, little, little things. But for the most part, like like you said, it, it was a, it was a, it was a game changer for I can say for the community that watched a lot of people who saw a hero like that on the screen, like that was big culturally it was a big thing for Chadwick Boseman that still resonated. Right. And also, like you said, man, it was, it was a damn good movie, you know, like regardless. So I think all of that, that is really important. And to go back to that point, Wolverine, I love that movie. So I'm with you on that. Like, I've seen it three times, one to see it four to five. I mean, it's still running. I still might. But the point being is like, 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 like you said, it was the first watch was like, wow, that was amazing. Second watch, I picked up more that I enjoyed that I missed in terms of like lines, but I also saw more holes. Third time, I was like, oh, wow. They, yeah. That, oh, wow. That's a big hole. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like Matt said, that when it's it's a good movie, top 20 for me, definitely not a perfect film. Not even on the yeah. list. I, I The thing that I thought was really cool about um, Black Panther is, so I remember the old Black Panther Marvel Knights, um, Christopher Priest and Mark Texera um, run way back when. It was one of my favorite Marvel Knights books. And I thought they did a pretty good job bringing that whole vibe of that run to that movie. And I thought it was pretty cool how close to lore that that, that, that movie stayed to. That was pretty impressive, and it may made it super entertaining. You know, I mean, it, I'll I'll throw this in, be, but you know, the first Thor movie, that was comic book Thor, you know, but people didn't like it, you know. Um, but this, they spun it in a way that was very well received, and that's what was really impressive. Second thing I thought was really impressive about Black Panther is, like you guys mentioned, Killmonger. It, he was a villain that you uh, that you you sympathized with, and they gave a good story. But never there was there a point where I was rooting for Killmonger, you mm. know. And I feel like there's a huge difference between that. That's and, fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, I would never once was like, oh man, man, maybe Killmonger should be Black Panther. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's definitely a point where I was like, he he has a claim to this, this title, you know, mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. going to go get his birthright. And, you know, it's, it was more like a, you're, you're sympathizing with his struggle and what he's trying to obtain. I mean, you're still rooting for Ch- T'Challa and, right. and everything, but you know, you, you're sympathetic. You have a sympathetic ear for, or I, or whatever you want to call it for, for Killmonger and his trying to claim what he feels is his birthright. Right. Right sympathy it's to crossing that line and where you're like you can tell the filmmaker wants you to root for the bad guy and i didn't i didn't feel like that like that went through to that, that carried through at all um nobody's mentioned ant-man do you think ant the first ant-man belongs on this either one of you guys um yeah i mean it's as far as ant-man like again it was one of those characters that wasn't well known and expect you know especially the scott lang version scott lang's probably a little bit better known than hank pym but it's still like like i feel like one of those characters that wasn't on everybody's radar and i think that's why you see it it wasn't like the big box office hit like some of these other movies were but i think as far as ant-man goes the introduction to the character um even though you really don't have a lot of other than hope and hank pym you don't really have a lot of the side characters out of those movies showing up anywhere else other than Ant-Man right. movies. Um, but I think it, it, it deserves to be there because there's probably one of the more accurate origin stories. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, I have it like nine or 10. Like it was fine. I, yeah. I would definitely have a way or down further down the list than it is. It's nine. It's, it is nine. I'd probably have it at 10 then, but uh, yeah, wherever it is, it's too high. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> but like i agree i'll be honest with you out of all the, the movies you listed the one movie i've only seen once is shang chi deservedly so really it was good i like uh, yeah but, 
uh, it just I felt like okay, well, it's a one and done. It doesn't feel like it has a lot of rewatchability or or play in it. I, I mean, yeah, I. That's a good question. I mean, I I enjoy like right now. I got I, it's a good question I ask myself. I'm like, why I don't like it as much? Like I thought it was a really really good movie. I've seen it a handful of times. Um, that happens to be my girl's favorite Marvel movie, which I find very interesting. But then she also won't watch the Batman. So really, what does she know? Um, but anyways, we're not watching this, so it's fine. Anyways, <laughs> um, like for me, I I enjoyed Shang Chi. I felt that it maybe tried to do. Culturally, I'm sure it was a big movie as well. It didn't have the same beats. I think the performances were different. Um, I like that we finally got the actual Mandarin. You know, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, at least that's comic actors we're going to get. Um, I enjoyed the final fight. I think the dragon just kind of threw everything off for me. I don't know why. It's a very specific point where I was like, oh, and here we go. Like, like, like that was the moment. Like, the fight was built. I actually believed that um, the Mandarin, like he was looking for his um, like wife. Like there was so many emotional components there that it should have went a lot darker, but kept that same line that it already had, which there was some humor in it. There was, you know, but you had a line of like, wow, you know, like this is, this is crazy. Um, and then is she, I, I remember going, is she alive? Is she dead? Like the main motivation for the villain made sense. All of it made sense. And then at the very end, I was like, what is going on? You have dragons. And it was a lot of, mystical animals and such but it, even for a marvel film i just found myself going like oh there's like the eternals like i just kind of found myself like phasing out very quickly so mm-hmm. still enjoyed the movie just thought the third third act was a lot going on but it would be if 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 ant-man is like 10 i'd probably put it like 11 okay the, the only thing that i i just i can't get past and you know and it's fine i, I get not everything's going to be comic book accurate, right? But this movie, like the only thing that it has in common with its comic book counterpart, pretty much are names. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I can't, you know, it, it just drives me nuts when, when it, it's to me, it's, it's such a disrespect of of lore to just come up with all these things and I, on your own change characters um i felt like there's so many missed opportunity you know you, you 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 talked about dragons why couldn't one of them have been fin fang foom just stick fin fang foom in there i would have liked it a little bit more but i sit there and i'm like oh this is gonna you know oh here he comes oh that's nope 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 you know I, I, you know, it, it, the, the characters that were, you know, Aquafina, not a big fan. So, I, 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 this is probably one of my least favorite MCU movies. Um, that, you know, I, I put that right, right in front of Eternals as one of my least favorites. <laughs> wow. Um, but I, you know, I also like first, uh, captain america first avenger yeah i was gonna say where's the love for cap america first avenger yeah, on this list like, that was a that should have been on there story. over shang chi oh yeah big time yeah i agree that was a good movie but always uh, if it's on fx or something you know how it is on usa or whatever oh, like yeah. I, I'll, I'll definitely give it a glance so yeah i agree yeah all right fellas let's let's move on um to the uh the new absolute dc titles that are coming out here shortly uh we got batman corbin's like my time to shine wonder yeah corbin's like oh rubber yeah 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 the hands are coming together (laughs) (laughs) batman superman wonder woman uh so dc uh debuted new cover arts and logos uh for their absolute universe it's an announced in july and debuting this fall, DC Comics has a new absolute universe of comic books hitting shelves at your local comic book store in October, November, and beyond. Today, DC revealed, well, I guess not today, but DC revealed the main covers of the first three, which is Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman, along with new logos and variant covers. So, fellas, okay, so absolute. Uh, let's start with Absolute Batman number one. Scott, Scott Snyder and Nick Dragota. Introduce fans to a new Batman 
in this iteration, fans will be introduced to a version of the Dark Knight that doesn't have the money, the mansion, the butler, or his core line counterparts. Is that a good thing or bad thing? What do you guys think? I'll let Matt go first on this one. I think it's a good thing. I think it's an interesting, going to be an interesting play at DC again, trying to try their hand in an alternate universe. I think they kind of saw a little bit about how Marvel's ultimate universe relaunch went and they're like, well, maybe we should try that. Um, interesting to see Batman without all those things. And in a, in a bigger, he's a, a, a bigger specimen. He's almost a Bane like in this new story. Mm-hmm. And I know the, the big bat symbol has caused some controversy here <laughs> and there, but um. I have all the faith in the world of Scott Snyder when it comes to write Batman. I mean, look what he did with the character on New 52. I think it's it's good. It's going to be good, and it's going to be interesting enough that it's going to pump some life into a, a character that is iconic, but in my opinion, kind of getting stale. Like, it's going to be nice to see a little refresh uh, and reboot on Batman as we know it and, and kind of turn it on its head a little bit. I think to to maybe bring back some readers to you know bring in new readers and maybe bring back some readers that might have fallen off the the normal Batman title. Yeah, yeah, that's a thick Batman logo, dude. Listen, they say boy. those thick thighs they're gonna say some lies, <laughs> but but we know this is gonna happen, right? I, I I gotta say I agree with Matt. I think that DC in general, I mean, we already know how convoluted, not even convoluted, but how flooded the market as a batman books and and i want to say good reason batman does sell right but there's been a lot of of comics on that you have an event obviously right now you had a few events for dc and they need to find some traction and i like the fact they're not rebooting again or going back into yeah. you know 5g and new 52 and rebirth and all these other initiatives they've had and doing something more akin to the ultimate line right where it's okay we have our main line of stories so you can read those or get on board with this brand new book with these whole new looks at, at heroes that you know and love, but are going to be different. So, you know, variety is the spice of life, right? You still have that main line if you want to go there, but now you have a whole lot of interesting things to read as well. Like you said, we haven't seen a Batman in this, in this form. Matt described it best, like a, like a, not a Hulk, a Bane type character. Like the best I can describe it was those old 90s Superman um, cartoons where Batman and Superman like crossed over and Superman, like I think it was called nighttime or something where Superman like, dressed up in the Dark Knight outfit, but that Batman was so bulky, it didn't even look that different. You know what I mean? So this is a different beat altogether. I'm excited for where it goes. Um, I think the Batman's gotten most of the attention, rightfully so, but Wonder Woman's going to be interesting. Superman, I'm sure, will have his fans as well, and there's more books that are going to come out. Well, I know there's a rumored Flash book. There's some more that's going to come out. I just hope that DC comes at it with the sense of the, the sense of time. And what I mean by that is not rushing things. Like, let it breathe, you know, build up these characters, build up this world. Don't use this as, like, a really quick, get get rich quick kind of scheme to keep the mainline universe going. Like, don't rush. I don't want to see a crisis in, like, four months. You know what I mean? So I think that's the yeah. important thing is how they go about, okay, we have this whole new universe with characters that you know and love but are a little bit different. How can we keep that going, keep that engagement high? It's going to be high for week one. It's the number one for three books, right? I think Batman comes first, and then what? Wonder Woman, Superman, I forgot. But the point being, keeping the engagement high so that you do get consistent sales, not just for the initial Wednesday, but each corresponding one for these books. So you're saying that they need to commit Yes, and commit. I don't mean, oh wow, first reviews were horrible. Let's change everything. Or like, remember, um, what did they? Okay, I, you both will remember faster than I will. But before um, the Joshua Williamson last Infinite Earths Christ, and it wasn't called Christ at Infinite Earths to begin with. It was called. Do I remember? Um, oh my God! Uh, yeah, I, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it was the different title, and then it went to Crisis. And that felt so derivative. That felt, darn, I can't remember. But y'all know what I mean. Yeah. Like, that felt so reactive. There you go. It's like, oh, like, maybe that was the plan all along. I doubt it. But maybe it was. Um, Dark Crisis. Mm. It was Dark Crisis. And then it was Dark Crisis on the Infinite Earths. And immediately, you could tell what they were trying to make a play for. And immediately, you're like, what? No, 
Like it, it threw off. I mean, we kept reading, you know, the death of the Justice League, like, and it was called Justice League Road to Dark Crisis. And then after that, boom. You know, it, it, in fact, it was Dark Crisis for the first three issues. And number four became Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. By the time that happened, I was like, are you serious? You know what I mean? And, and what yeah. long lasting ramifications did we get from that? I mean, a few. A it was really seen the Justice League, but like, like that's it. You know what I mean? So I, as long as that's what I mean, like, don't do that. Like, don't be reactive. L- let it get some room to breathe. Build out these characters. Stick to what you planned. Apparently, it's been something in the works for six years. Stick to that. Yeah. You know, and don't just go off the first thing you see on on Comic Book Nation or whatever. Yeah. So the Dark Knight book comes out October 9th. Um, and so <clears throat> one thing that I am kind of grateful for is um, I'm glad that they're not replacing this with the regular bat titles because um you know this might be my you know my old man coming out but i enjoy batman books because there's a certain amount of comfort in them you know there's the bat there's the universe you already know you know there's you know you read a batman book you know you're gonna Selena Kyle's probably going to be in it, you know, or, or some familiar villains, his familiar, well, right now, it's not really, but his familiar mansion, his, you know, you know what you're going to get. And there's a certain amount of comfort in that for me. Same thing with Superman, you know, you know, you, there's going to be a metropolis, you know who he is, you know, you know, Lois and there's Jimmy Olsen, you know, what, you know what I mean? So I'm glad they're not replacing this with that. Um, but it's, that being said, it does seem like an interesting take on, you know, on these characters. Um, so the second one that's going to come out um, October 23rd is Absolute Wonder Woman number one. And this says, for Diana, there is no island paradise, no sisterhood to shape her, nor a mission of peace. So what is the purpose of an Amazon warrior in this new universe? And it's going to be written by Kelly Thompson and art by Hayden Sherman. Just going to reinvent the Wonder Woman. I don't know if you guys are as excited about this as Batman, but I mean, I'll definitely be picking this up. I mean, it's it's harder to, to be, I think. Um, I mean, if you look at the Batman, it's in perfect hands with Scott Snyder. Like, Scott Snyder gave you some iconic, not only Batman moments, but villains like Court of Owls, Bloom, the Batman who laughs like he's taken Batman in so many interesting directions that I think him, you know, taking down Batman bare bones to his core to seeing a, a stripped down Batman do his thing is going to be interesting. Um, the same with Wonder Woman. Like, it, I just hope it doesn't get too preachy and a more of a story about her, you know, where she's looking for her place and. I don't know. I don't really know what to expect with with a Wonder Woman book from that, and, and I think maybe that unknown and that fear of the unknown is a little intri- intriguing to me it, to at least pick up the first issue. Mm-hmm. Very much a mountain that Wonder Woman just isn't my cup of tea in terms of character, at least the way that she's been characterized. I have a few writers. Um, this one sounds intriguing in the sense of yeah, it's not what I'm used to, so. I'll check out number one, see how that goes, and that kind of guide my purchasing decisions moving forward. But, I mean, again, we talked about the price point for comics in general. Uh, these these absolute books are going to be no exception. I definitely want to be more mindful of that. You know, you want to commit money to what you, you know, they say support your your your, your creators, and I plan on doing that. But what stories are actually good, right? Because at the end of the day, we do work very hard. And, and Matt, you have multiple kids. Jay, you have kids as well. Like, that, come on, these comics are not, it's not a cheap hobby now. Yeah, you know? yeah, at a four ninety nine so, price point, you got to be a little bit more particular about what you're going to pick versus right. just being like, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm more willing to throw four ninety nine at an issue one to see what's going to happen." But after that, if like it doesn't grab me, like you got to do a little bit more work, I think, to re- grab the reader in issue one if you want him to keep shelling out that four ninety nine price point, especially when what it was um, three four years ago where DC's like. No, we're rebooting. Our books are going to be two ninety nine. That's what they're going to be, and then all of a sudden, now we're back to to three ninety nine, four ninety nine. Yeah, exactly, so, right. exactly. With some backups that nobody wanted. Yeah. Um. So the last one is Absolute Superman 
number one coming out November 6th. And that's going to be written by Jason Aaron and art by Rafa Sandoval. And this one uh, it says, this Superman has no family, no fortress of solitude, and no home. Will he still stand for truth and justice in this new universe? I think I this like book Superman excites me. I'm not a Superman fan. I've been notoriously a Superman hater, but I like that they're taking all that. They're taking pretty much everything that makes Superman away from him. The the Boy Scout aspect, the family, the Kents. You're, you're seeing a lot of that, I think, going to be stripped down, and you're going to see the flaws in him and see how it, what, what these decisions he makes going to lead him to the Superman we know, or is it going to be somewhere else? I like that with this absolute line, they are going to remove those constraints that we're normally used to is like Batman has his moral compass. Well, it doesn't sound like he might not have that moral compass or at least not the same moral compass in this uh, you know, absolute Batman. It's kind of the same with Superman. Like he's always like that, that truth, justice. And, and, and well, what if it's a little bit, a, a little bit more gray than it is black and white with him, you know, or, what you know he's a little bit more more morally conflicted than he is just you know well this is the way and this is what we got to do and truth and golden boy and I, i'm interested to see superman a, a little bit darker a little bit more gritty and maybe getting his hands a little bit more bloody than than he used to yeah yeah i like superman a lot so uh, i'll definitely be picking this up um how about you corbin yeah, again, I think all the absolute books I have to give a try, right? Um, yeah. This is intriguing to see how the Superman goes. I don't know. I feel like, again, it depends on the direction. Like, I, Superman at the end of the day does inspire hope. I do want to be more, as Matt said, more morally ambiguous, right? In terms of, you know, well, the best way is my way. And it's like, what is your way, Superman? Like, what do you lean on? You don't have the bedrock of your foundation, you know, your community to kind of back you up. You know, so so what does that look like, right? Now, is he going to run amok and go full bright burn on us? Doubtful. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like, I, I definitely want to see, uh, I think there's real potential for character growth and some real character development because we don't know what the Superman is, but we know we cannot stay whatever way he'll start and still be Superman as we know it. So where they go with that, I think, is anyone's guess, but got to give it a shot to begin with. I, I, in order of, like, excitement, I'd probably go Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, because I haven't seen the Superman before. I definitely haven't seen this Batman before, and the Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Woman is interesting. But, yeah, we'll, we'll give Superman a look as well. Cool. Cool. All right, so let's um, let's talk new books. Any new books you guys have been reading that have, you know, been – uh, made an impact of any kind on you guys? You guys are really digging it all. Um, I'll definitely let Matt kind of go a little further here. I recently read um, Aliens and Avengers, um, Jonathan Hickman and Asad Rebic, if I said that right. Um, it's going to be a four-parter. Uh, been delayed a couple times. Uh, finally just dropped, what, last week? And yeah. really enjoyed that. Um, the Xenomorphs are reaching Earth. You have, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a team of heroes. Uh, I guess it's been teased Iron Man and and Captain America all are on certain covers, so I'm sure they'll be in. As of now, they are not. Like, the core heroes that we saw were, you know, T'Challa, uh, the Incredible Hulk, Captain Marvel, and Miles Morales. And based off of looking at T'Challa, like, it doesn't define it in the story at all, really. But looking at the artwork, you can see, okay, these are older heroes. Like the Tala is definitely, I want to say, you know, late 50s, early 60s. Hulk is in that same vein. You don't really see Miles Morales. He has some he has some Venom symbiote he's tied to. Uh, don't want to spoil anything. I guess I just did, but it already came out. So there's, there's that. But we don't know his age. But the point being, these heroes are not in their physical prime. And you do have these xenomorphs that are, you know, I say really well done illustrating the book. And it's really almost this, like, The Walking Dead meets Marvel meets Alien. You know, clash of intellectual properties, right? So, for the first book, um, I thought there was a lot of exposition, but I really thought it set the stage pretty well. Uh, I did like the artwork again, and I do feel like it's an interesting look at making the heroes older. 
because for whatever reason, like these xenomorphs, we know how vicious they are. We know what they can do. And you see these heroes and like, yes, they can still take care of business. They can still get things done, but they're not, you know, the, the, the Hulk of old and, and the, the, the Captain America of old. And how that impacts the heroes' interactions with these xenomorphs over the course of the series, I think will be very, very interesting. Cool. Yeah, it's a, it looks like an interesting book. I mean, I, I I didn't pick it up only because if it's Hickman and I love Hickman, but asking Hickman to stick a landing in four issues of a mini series is a big ask, <laughs> a real big ask. So I, I that's was very like, fair. And, and back to what we were talking about at that four ninety nine or five ninety nine. Usually books like that are five ninety nine. I don't know if this one was a four ninety nine or not. Mm-hmm. But you you got to choose, and it's like this is a four issue mini series, and I don't want to waste that money getting invested in, in that that story when it could be spent in another story that I'm already invested in. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm interested to see what you keep having to say about it because I I mean I've heard like you said I've heard other shows kind of poo poo it, and then I've you know I've heard some people say good things about it, so I'm I'm definitely interested to see. If you uh, keep digging it, and that one I, I might read on like online or something, just because it's not a it's not a story that that caught me. And and I, and I, I acute that to a mistake I made of buying Predator versus Black Panther because yeah. that book was terrible, and the art in that book was so awful that it took away from the story and made it just unbearable to read so i I think that's kind of where i'm like out on this alien and predator mixing in with your current run of marvel heroes i was really excited when um when um uh disney and 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 marvel acquired fox and they were going to start putting out the alien books and the Planet of the Eight books and the Predator books. And I was on board for a few of those and they were not good. <laughs> so ever since then, I, I've stayed away from the alien and predator. Um, but I am a little interested at, at uh, uh, about on this alien versus Avengers book. So I got it. I haven't read it, um, but it seems pretty cool. Um, so we'll see. So Corbin, you know, liking it a little bit gives it a little bit of hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, although Maggie gave a great point about Hickman and the landings. Like that is something you're right. Like, and, oh, yeah. and for the price point seven ninety nine. Like you know, it, it's it's that book was seven ninety nine. Yeah. Oh boy, I'm glad I put that. Let that <laughs> yeah, one yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm just gonna say support your creators. Um, but there's also you know there's the read comics. I think the first thing is to read comics. Um. How do you read comics? I have a blind eye to that. So read comics. Um, I'll leave it there. Hick, I mean, but you, Hickman's got so many books going right now. You can support him on other titles too. But. Exactly. And then, you know, the, the comics are worldwide and online. I'll leave that there. Um, so one of the things that I, I've been enjoying a lot more than I thought I would are the absolute power books that DC's been putting out. Um, I have steered clear from, uh, you know, uh, overarching events because they just, they're a huge waste of money. They never really pan out. Um, and it's just been a waste and you invest for all this for absolutely nothing. Nothing really changes, but absolute power has been pretty good. I mean, I don't, I'm not, all I'm reading is, the, the DC books that tie into it, like, uh, you know, Nightwing, Batman, Superman, all that, Green Arrow, um, and just the absolute power core title. I haven't been reading all the peripherals, but it's been pretty good. I've actually been liking it. Um, you know, it, it, it Amanda Waller's kind of forced um, everybody, all you know, all the, the DC heroes into kind of like a resistance position, you know, they're kind of hiding out, um, and, you know, without their powers and, uh, you've got, um, got fail safe and uh, brainiac queen that are kind of doing the heavy lifting and, and, uh, you know, chasing after all the, the heroes. And it's been pretty cool. 
It's pretty good. I mean, I'll honestly, man, I have not read a DC book since Joker year one. <sighs> um, I love Joker year one personally, but the, the absolute or the uh, whole um, event that's going on in DC right now, the absolute power. I read the, I think it was the free comic book day one. Mm. Of it, the the preview and it, it just didn't sell me so i've kind of been out on on dc right now and i'm I'm looking forward to the the new ultimate stuff starting the absolute stuff but right now uh-huh. DC, dc's main main titles have not kept my interest i'm still on board i i, I you know I'm, yeah i'm a dc guy so i've been keeping track on and off absolute power you know between task force um um, Ground Zero, the number one, done the Batman tie-ins, I've done the Superman tie-ins. So I've been kind of keeping track of it. Uh, DC Universe Infinite's also been helping with that as well. Uh, just the ones that I mean, I already bought the series, so the ones I'm not buying, I'm definitely reading. Uh, I do agree with that in the sense that, you know, the stories are of mixed quality, right? But I think the build-up is going to be the real payoff. And for that, those stories are serving their purpose, right? So... At this point, I feel like we, we we go to the stage all the time with these big comic book events where every story is inevitably leading. So a lot of it is, by nature, filler, right? And so really, it's just what filler am I more interested in reading and spending, again, like we said a few times here, your hard, hard-earned money on. Um, yeah. But as it stood so far, I can't say it's been horrible. It's just being a lot more selective, kind of really knowing your universe and knowing, okay, well, the Batman court kind of feels important, right? And let's see what Task Force does. And maybe Superman, because Brainiac Queen's there. And just kind of putting all these together for that um, for that storyline, that uh, event. But also keeping in mind that, you know, the absolute, the difference is coming. Yeah. So, um, as far as books... We're picking up in the future. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't get to talk about my book that I'm Oh, you didn't talk about it? I thought right, you right. did. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, to, yeah. Sorry. Trying sorry. to push me off. Uh, yeah. For anyway, me, actually, it was uh, a number one. Chasm Curse of Cain, number one, uh, was a book that I picked up last week that caught me a little bit by surprise. Um, I'm a I'm a Kane Parker fan. Like, he's, I, I love Ben Riley, but... I also really like Kane Parker as, as Scarlet Spider. So it's interesting to see their dynamic come back into play and kind of uh, Kane hunting down Chasm for what Chasm's kind of been become. Um, it's interesting to see, again, their their dynamic and relationship renewed and revived. Um, I'm glad to see Kane getting a little bit more love in comics uh, again because uh, his what 2010s run was... I think it was 2010's run was, was phenomenal. Um, so definitely digging that, but I'm also still reading, you know, Spider-Man. We just got uh, the first issue of uh, Zeb Wells and uh, John Romita Jr.'s final arc on Spider-Man uh, kicked off. So checking that out. But I was definitely uh, digging Chasm, Curse of Cain last week. Who's going to be writing that now? Do you know? They haven't... Um, they haven't announced they haven't it yet. Announced it yet? No. There's. Oh my gosh. I can't remember who it was. There was speculation of a new team, but it sounds like it's just going to be an event leading into the new, well, um, Spider-Man bi-weekly stuff. Uh, but I can't remember who it was. They said it was going to do it. Hmm. Like the new Venom event? Is that what's going on? Well, there's Venom War, but this is like a yeah. the reboot of of Spider Man of the you know bi weekly Spider Man title because Zeb Wells is leaving, and so is uh, Ramita Junior. I can't remember who they said is gonna. Joe Kelly, Joe Kelly, is oh. coming back to. But because there was a a preview on the back of a a moon Knight book a few weeks ago. It says plus a new era for of amazing Spider-Man from Joe Kelly begins here. So I don't know if it's actually like the new writers or if it's just like a transitional arc that's going to lead into the next era of Spider-Man. But Mm. um, 
I'm I'm sad to see Zeb Wells go, but I'm not sad to see John Romita Jr. go. Yeah, me either. His art has not been kind to that book. I agree. So. I agree. It's legendary as that name is, man. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, too blocky, a lot of lines. <laughs> uh well, I mean, yeah. when you when you think of Amazing Spider-Man, like there's only a few artists that really come to mind as far as like hardcore iconic Spider-Man artists, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one. I mean, like, at least he, you can say that uh, John Romita Jr. At least his art's got some signature to it. You remember it. You know it's what it is as soon as you see it. Well, yeah, because like know? when you think Mark, when you think Amazing Spider-Man, you automatically boom Steve Ditko. Ramita Senior, yeah, Junior, yeah, yeah, McFarlane, yeah. Yeah. Um, who else? Um, Mark, Mark Bagley. Bro- Bagley, Bagley, exactly. Yeah. Bagley. So it's like you can crank off a couple of iconic names, uh, Humberto Ramos. You know, so it's it's just like, but Ramita Junior's stuff now. Like I've said many, many times on many, many different platforms, he got in that kick ass era, and he can't get out of it. You can't get out of the b- big blocky heads. Yeah. Everyone's got like that crow magnum brow. Yeah. You know, or, and it's just, he can't get out of it. So, um, when we had a few weeks of, when we had the, uh, uh, re- green goblin stuff a few weeks ago, it was nice to see a change of artist and how much it does for that book. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm excited to see who the next artist on Spider-Man is going to be. Uh, as long and not, you know, along with the writer. So, but that I was concur. my book for, for last week is that, that chasm book. Nice. So, All right, fellas. Well, what are you guys picking up? So Anything? yeah, coming, you're talking about for this upcoming week. Yeah. For Wednesday, yeah. September 11th. Let's do Wednesday, September 11th. Let's do it. Um, you guys want me to just run through some stuff? I was say, yeah, you. How about you share what you're reading first? And we'll kind of work around. Okay, so um, Amazing Spider-Man number fifty-seven. Uh, that'll be a pickup. Uncanny X-Men number two, FF number twenty-five, um, Batman and Robin number thirteen. Oh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two. Um, I have never. I haven't been a. a big turtles fan but i picked up the number one a few weeks ago and it was pretty cool that's crazy how gritty it was i didn't expect it to be that dark yeah it's definitely definitely interesting what they're doing with the turtles and how they're kind of splitting them up across three to four different titles um and what where they're going because you kind of see like the night watcher stuff they had the other a few weeks ago was was jenica and then you had the first issue of, Foc- of Turtles focus on Raphael in jail. Yeah. I'm interested yeah, to see the what the I first think. issue of Mutant Nation is about. But yeah, Turtles. Turtles looks like they're in good hands and ready to keep going strong. Yeah. That Raphael in jail one, man. That was brutal stuff. <laughs> I was pretty surprised. Um, it's, I don't know about Star Wars. You know, I hear they're going to change eras again where they're going to go post Return of the Jedi. And I'm going to start doing Battle of Jakku stuff. Um, And so as soon as I find out like a book is like ending or like, you know, I kind of feel like, why, why am I bother? You know, it's like, why bother? Um, So I might hold off on that. I don't know if if you guys read Department of Truth. Uh, A lot of people like it. That's kind of about it. Yeah. Department of Truth number 25. Um, Captain America number 13. Um. Another absolute power tie-in, uh, Task Force Seven, number mm-hmm. six. I won't be picking that up. Uh, see, I'm, I don't go that that peripheral. Um, Gotham by Gaslight, The Kryptonian Age, number four. Corbin, have you been reading that? I have not, and that's you know, that's honestly something I'm going to catch up and do some this this next week because it kind of slipped on the radar for me. I was aware of it months in advance with solicitations, and then it kind of came, and I was like, wait, what? So that's someone definitely going to be hyped on. I don't know. I think a lot of it, you know, rest in peace of Brian Augustine and the crew from, you know, I mean, with the kind of the headline I forgot in my gaslight to kind of see it evolve in this way. Can't say I was most intrigued by it, just the premise. 
Uh, it is a Batman book. I'm a Batman guy, so I will check it out. But it's not something I've been really rushing to. Kind of makes me wonder if he was maybe stonewalling that project to be released a little bit because it's it's interesting that they released it after his passing. Mm-hmm. No, agreed. And and and, and, and year, we and all year. know that Bat- Gotham and Gaslight isn't my favorite Batman story, but yeah, you know, it's still like it. I give it respect where respect is due, but it's it's just interesting the timing of them releasing a sequel to that. I agree. I just also don't think it was one that needed to be done. I think that book was very important in showing that Batman could be in any universe, right? In any time period. And I really kicked off so many other multiverse books that we've seen, right? But I, I, I never thought, wow, let's go back into that world. Like, I, I considered it one of the great books. It still isn't a book I thought, let's go back and revisit that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it got to be honest with you, it got kind of lost in the shuffle for me. Like I have number one, but they're already at <laughs> number four. And you know well, like, three comes, the, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, the Dark Knights of Steel, the new Dark Knights of Steel book came out, the new DC versus vampires came out, and like all these like Elseworld type books, and then that one just kind of got lost for me, but hmm. um so I think the that about does it for me um looking at all these other things yeah for me personally uh, i mean i'm gonna pick up spider-man 57 yeah um i'm into the venom war stuff even though i shouldn't be so i'll be picking up venom 37 (laughs) and venom and carnage number two and separation anxiety and all the venom books um Spider one of the books that if you're not reading, you should definitely check out if you're a Spider-Man fan, Spider-Man Rain. Really? Two. Yeah. Spider-Man Rain 2, issue three. That book has been so good so far. If you were looking for a different tale to see a much older Spider-Man, mm-hmm. it, that is is the book for you. It has been great the first two issues. I'm I'm so stoked for issue three. Older than what he is in Ultimate? Yes. Like, I'm talking, like, old man, massive like gray beard. He's, like, 70. He spent, like yeah, he spent, Caesar Spider-Man? Like, like, Dark Knight Returns, but older Spider-Man. Yeah, Whoa. and he, he spent a long time under the thumb of the Kingpin and just getting, like, brutally beaten down. And, mm-hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's been it's a fun read so far to kind of seeing what's going on with that um interesting as far as dc goes not a lot of dc titles that interest me right now interesting no i'm just kidding um it is (laughs) um maybe the wesley dodson the sandman um book i might pick up uh as far as dark horse goes not a whole lot of stuff there uh image uh kind of the same there for me transformers 12 because i've been Digging the Transformers stuff. Johnny Quest number two. I'm a huge Johnny Quest fan. So the first one kind of read like an old school episode of Johnny Quest. So I'm I'm stoked for that from Dynamite. Um Fun. Space Ghost. Been I've been enjoying the Space Ghost comic book series just because like I said, it's that that nostalgia for me. And definitely, of course, Turtles, the second issue of Ninja Turtles. Um so stoked for that. I wish I could get issue three of The Last Ronin already, but they like to take their sweet time with that. <clears throat> but very true. Um, for me, I'm very I mean, I'm gonna do we're gonna do the Marvel first. We're gonna do Venom Separation Anxiety. It's been a good book. I will check out um Spider Man Rain, because like Matt said, um really good story. I mean, the first one's already the, this is number two. Um the, the original is already out on trades, very good, highly recommend all of Honic, that. Yes. Yes, just so, so good. Um, Batman Robin 13, Nightwing Uncovered, Outsiders number 11 um, as well. And then Sirens, I think number three is what I'm interested in. So I'm really digging the Batman books, as you know. Um, we, these are the list of books I have right now. I go through a vetting process as well. Like when I get to the shop, I'll go, okay, let's read this again. Like Let's read, let's read the storyline. Am I really interested in doing this or can I wait? Um so probably going to narrow it down to Batman, Robin, Sirens, and Venom and Separation Anxiety. I know those books have been solid. Oh, and Spider-Man Rain. I know those books have been solid. I'm familiar with the artwork. I'm a fan of that, too. Um, but I definitely plan on just kind of going at it and, and really reading stuff that kind of strikes my fancy. And if, this is what I like about this type of show is books that John mentioned that I wasn't necessarily aware of or thought highly of. Well, Matt thinks it's interesting. Jay thinks it's interesting. Maybe I'll check it out. So um, now a few more that I will look at. 
Cool. All right, guys. Uh, if there's nothing else, any last comments, grievances, <laughs> fist uh, shakes? Be on the lookout for whenever this comes out. Um, if it comes out before this week's new comic book day, uh, be on the lookout for Ultimate number uh what's this five four, four or five four I thought it was four Hold i on. could be wrong yeah ultimate number four okay. um it's being uh pushed by the writer as the uh kind of behind the looking glass of what marvel might potentially be doing with the uh introduction of dr doom in the mcu and how they may go about introducing him um so it's definitely worth picking up if you didn't and you can get your hands on it at your lcs if you missed it um, I'll let you know next week if it was lived up to the hype, but just know it is on that hype radar right now of a book you might want to be checking out. Mm, very interesting. There you go. I just want to say uh, fun getting back on this with y'all. Really look forward to talking some more comics in general and kind of getting back in this world and, you know, sharing our love for sequential storytelling. Right. And, uh, as I mean, if we have a few, all of us here love to kind of go into back issues, but as a guy who loves reading the back issues and such, I look forward to bringing some more thoughts and kind of opinions and conversation with y'all moving forward with that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to stick to this, you know, necessarily to this exact format, you know, like Corbin said, we'll be talking about previous runs, you know, maybe some artists and some writers, you know, spotlights and, you know, whatever we come up with, you'll just have to tune in, find out what exactly we're going to be mouthing off on. So uh, that about does it for the premiere episode of Comic Book Confidential. Uh, on behalf of my co-hosts, Matt and Corbin, I want to say thank you for listening and uh, tune in next week. And we'll have a brand new, brand new conversations for you to, to dig into. 